Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Today we're going to discuss how to grow a lot of food on a little land because you may very well have more land than you think you do or you may be looking for far more land than you actually need. So let's do it. All right, so occasionally when I tell people, especially like larger scale growers, that our entire growing space is about three quarters of an acre, there is a bit of an eye roll as if it's a little bit more than a backyard garden. But when I explain that we cram roughly three to five acres worth of production in that space, their eyes unroll. It's very weird looking. <sighs> but the reality is that space does not dictate your level of production as much as good design, smart planning, and proper usage does. Like, if your goal is to grow more food, chances are that you don't need more space, you need to utilize the space that you have a little bit better. So I want to talk about some of the ways that we do that here on our farm, and how it could look on basically any scale. But first, I want to tell you about the folks who made this video possible, and in many ways our style of farming possible, BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy, where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Uh, discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crops, spreading compost, mowing under fences, not over them, learn that one the hard way, clearing snow and more, all powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. Tractors and attachments are on sale now. Find sale pricing and your nearest dealer at bcsamerica.com. Okay, so one of the big ways we make our farm more compact starts with the use of permanent beds. Now, this has been talked about ad nauseum over the years by any and every grower, but I just want to quickly underline the value of keeping your growing space in the same spot year after year. First, for clarity, when I say that we use permanent beds, I'm not saying those beds with wooden borders or whatever. Those are fine too, of course, but they would cost us a pretty penny for our like 130 beds. Our beds are also four foot by 50 feet long, which is 1.22 meters by 15.24 meters or however the heck you metric folks measure such things. And the beds pretty much stay put year after year and crop after crop. The reason this is even worth pointing out is that a very common garden design, and in fact, the garden method I learned to farm with is to till the whole garden up every spring and sometimes again in the late summer and rebuild beds or rows every single time. But with permanent beds, sometimes called semi-permanent beds, you can skip the whole tillage thing, allowing you to get into your ground earlier, which will help you maximize space. However, by keeping the beds in one place, you can also work extensively on decompacting the soils and creating a lovely seed bed year after year and every time you need it. Uh, moreover, having the growing space in exactly the same place every season allows for better planning, more efficient fertilization, because you're not spreading compost, for instance, where your pathways might ultimately be, and less time spent working the soil. Uh, it does require you to choose a pathway management strategy, and I suggest watching this video for ideas on that, but pathways can also add a lot to the garden in terms of nutrients from wood chips, for instance, or pollinators from living pathways, and so on. Uh, and that brings me to the second thing that allows us to fit so much production into a small area, less soil work. In a tillage system, you are often going from one crop to another with, well, something like a tiller. Uh, this not only requires significant labor and sometimes fuel depending on the acreage, but it often requires a rest period for the soil if there was any raw organic matter worked into the soil. When you work something raw into the soil, it takes time for the soil to break that down and it ties up nitrogen. Then maybe you are losing crops to weeds brought up from deep in the soil and exposed to the ideal growing conditions provided by a tiller. Uh, if your time is being spent cultivating, then it is not being spent planting and harvesting. Perhaps needless to say, harvesting and planting should be the majority of the work of a farmer and will greatly help you maximize your space because not fighting weeds maximizes your time. Another thing that tillage requires is for the soil to not be too moist. So oftentimes, at least here in the east, where we have very wet soils up until March or even April or sometimes even May, making it borderline impossible to work the soil, because if you work the soil too wet, you have other issues like compaction, we can plant crops very early. Because I am not tilling, I am often planting crops in the field by the end of February while tillage farmers are still waiting for enough dry days to even start the garden prep process. Uh, another technical thing that we do is that we don't just grow one crop per bed per year. In fact, something like 75% of our beds see at least two crops per season. 
uh, around 50% see three and around 30% have four or more crops in a single growing year. Uh, and that's not including cover crops, which is done on about 70% of our growing space, at least once in the growing season. But it isn't just the number of crops that makes me suggest that we're cramming roughly five acres into one, it's also the spacing between the rows. You see, in a row cropping scenario, you are often basing your space between the rows of crops on the width of your tractor wheelbase or on your planter or whatever it is, so that sort of farming tends to require a lot more space. So an example might be carrots. Depending on whose guidance you take, a lot of row crop farmers plant their carrots in rows that are 18 to 24 inches apart. But by contrast, our rows of carrots are only four to six inches apart. So for every 15 feet, which would be three of our wide growing beds, we can fit 24 rows of carrots. In that same space, a row cropper might only fit seven to 10 rows of carrots. That's less than half the number of rows in the same amount of space. And that same thing applies to a lot of, if not most, of the other crops that we grow. One other bonus benefit to growing intensively is that by decreasing the amount of land that has to be in crop ground, we can increase the amount of natural habitat we have around for birds, bugs, snakes, all the things that help us with production. So not only can we fit more food into a smaller space, but more ecology to boot. Of course, not all crops can be crammed together quite the same as lettuce or carrots or whatever. Uh, take tomatoes and peppers, for instance. For those, there is often wasted space on the sides of the beds. That is where some of our basic interplanting techniques, as I describe in many a video on this channel, come into play. Uh, we may use that space to grow a crop of beets or green onions or lettuce just to ensure that we're getting the most out of that growing space that we have. We're not wasting any. So how that works is that we will plant the longer season crop either directly into a crop that's about to come out called relay cropping, or we will sow a crop next to the longer season crop after we plant it. So while that longer season crop matures, we can have another cash crop on its way. Take for instance, these super baby carrots you see here. I leave a 14 inch wide strip in the middle of the four foot wide bed so that I can transplant our tomatoes into these carrots right before the carrots start to come out in April. That's a relay crop. That just maximizes the amount of space I'm using in our tunnels and in our tomato beds. Infrastructure and equipment, in fact, are also some things to consider when it comes to maximizing space or cramming a bunch into a small area. Like the Rimmel greenhouses that we use or the Farmer's Friend cat tunnels that we use extend our season quite a bit as discussed in this video here. And by extending our season and growing intensively in these tunnels, we ultimately make better use of our space. In terms of equipment, when using like larger tractors, not only is more infrastructure required to store and work on them, but valuable crop ground is often gobbled up just by space to turn the thing around at the end of a row. So we only have to leave four or five feet at the end of our beds to turn around, which limits not only the wasted space, but the space that we have to keep mowed and cleaned. The BCS tractor is great for this because I can turn it around in just a few feet, depending on what attachment I'm using. I'm going to do a video soon touching on some of the smaller scale stuff that can be used to fill out all the unused or hard to use space on a farm, like these grow bags or this new garden socks kit I got that I'm excited to experiment with. Like we use our space pretty well and there is still a lot of space on our farm being wasted. Growing better, not bigger is an important thing to keep in mind always and may also allow for you to use some of that space, that outdoor space for something other than growing food, like our soccer field. Something that to me at least is just as important. Anyway, I wanna be clear that I do not think small farms can or necessarily should replace all large farms. My goal here is to say that small farms, when managed well, can be bigger than they seem. Small farms can produce an enormous amount of food, and small farms may be the only option financially that many of us can, or possibly should, access. There are notably countries like the Netherlands and Germany that provide fairly impressive models for what small farms can do, where they are both relatively small and space limited countries, but also in the top five leading exporters of food in the world, amazingly. Think about the size of the Netherlands. You, you could fit nearly 17 Netherlands in the state of Texas. And if you could scale the production by that same percentage, oh boy. And so I'll leave it at that for now. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook to support this work at notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch. I also highly recommend Ben Hartman's new book, The Lean Micro Farm. It spends a lot of time on this particular subject and I'll leave a link in the show notes for that. Become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash notillgrowers and get discounts on seeds and stuff like that. 
Uh, there may also be some farm tour tickets still available for Rough Draft Farmstead here at the farm if you want to come see it. There's like three events, I think. Or just hit that super thanks button, that works too. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. It's already recording. Oh, nice. <laughs> Sick. <laughs>